Hello everybody, my name is Ollie. I'm a doctor working in the NHS, currently in neurosurgery, and this is another addition to my med school interview series, which has spanned over many, many years. So for those of you that are preparing for your interviews at the moment for 2024 entry to medicine in the UK, good luck. Make sure you go back through that playlist, which I'll link in the description below, and watch out for something very special coming very soon. Today we're going to be talking about Martha's Law. This is a really significant development in the form of healthcare regulation designed to empower patients and their families. Martha's Law would allow a patient or their family to request a second medical opinion, and practically what that means is a review from the critical care outreach or intensive care outreach teams. If there is a suspicion of deterioration, or the patient getting worse or some other concern that they don't feel is being dealt with properly by the home team that is looking after the patient. Do note for the purposes of this video that it's not UK law yet as of November 2023, but steps are being made to bring it closer to legislation. The inception of Martha's Rule or Martha's Law is, as many of these named rules are, a response unfortunately to a tragic incident. It's named after a young girl, Martha Mills, who died in 2021, following an injury she sustained while on holiday with her family. And the circumstances of her death highlighted the need for this change. And Martha's parents, who were obviously bereaved by her untimely death, have campaigned very hard and advocated for this law after doctors failed to admit her to intensive care when she became very unwell, which may have saved her life if she was transferred there early enough. Specifically what happened is Martha fell off her bicycle while on holiday. She impacted the handlebars of the bike and received a laceration to her pancreas, one of the digestive organs that sits here on the left side behind the stomach. She was transferred to King's College Hospital in London, where unfortunately she deteriorated, and it's important to note that her parents repeatedly raised concerns to the medical team looking after her that she was getting worse, specifically they were concerned about sepsis, but her medical team reassured them that Martha would improve. She was eventually transferred to PQ, Paediatric Intensive Care, but by then it was far too late and sadly she died. So what will actually change? Well, from what's been published so far on this, the mechanism seems to be that patients and their families will have an independent means of contacting the hospital's critical care team to get a second review if they are concerned that the patient is getting worse or that they are not having their concerns dealt with properly by the medical team. You are legally assured a second opinion promptly. So what we're now going to do for the purposes of our medical school interview is think about this from the positives and the negatives. You have to split things into their good sides, their good elements, and their potential downsides, because you could be asked to argue for either side in an interview. So at the face of it, this is a good thing in terms of reducing paternalism and improving a patient's autonomy. This is giving patients and their families a bit more control and a bit more say in directing the care that they receive. It gives patients the security of knowing that they have a safe, non-judgmental means of getting another medical opinion if they feel that they're not being heard. Secondly, the possibility of a second opinion could actually encourage the primary team, that is the initial team that's looking after the patient, to do a more thorough and complete job during their initial assessment, because they would then know that their initial medical decisions may be reviewed and critiqued by their peers down the line, which isn't actually something that routinely happens in medical care. Thirdly, by acknowledging the importance of patient and family opinions in directing care, Martha's Law could actually foster a greater sense of trust in healthcare as a whole, because patients know that their concerns have to be addressed if they ask for it, as opposed to what can happen at the moment where patients sometimes feel as though they're being fobbed off and not listened to. And then finally, by providing a structured and clear means for people to ask for these second opinions, one that is specified and set out clearly in law, it may actually reduce the likelihood of legal disputes developing further down the line if patients are worried that their care team has been negligent. You can imagine that if if someone is worried that their team is being negligent and then they have engaged this process and received a second opinion, they might be much less willing and potentially much less able to bring a legal dispute at all, which reduces the burden of legal cases and negligence claims take up a huge amount of time and money for the NHS, so this is actually a potential saving of a huge amount of resource. However, we now need to think about some potential problems with this, because firstly the requirement of 
of all patients and their families being able to ask for a second opinion could immensely increase the workload of whoever this consulting team is. And this might be particularly challenging in hospitals, specialties and other areas that already struggle with significant workload issues and staff shortages. And you can imagine that in a busy city centre hospital like King's College Hospital, if suddenly you have several hundred patients, probably more, and every single one of them can now ask for a second opinion on all of these cases, you are exponentially going to increase the workload of a very small and already pressured group of people. This could vastly increase the workload of whoever this team is that is providing the second opinions. Linking on from that, because you've now got to provide these second opinions and you've got to ultimately deal with the resource cost of doing that, whether that means hiring extra staff, having these staff available 24 seven, having the administration and oversight, including documentation, audit, evidence-based research gathering on how these departments and teams perform. You've got to divert a portion of your overall budget to dealing with the oversight of this new system, just as you do with any healthcare development, and that takes away from your overall budget. So it's possible that you might improve the experience of care of these patients that are seeking second opinions, but that reduces the resource available at the whole level and potentially reduces the quality of care that the average patient will receive. And lastly, the addition of a second medical opinion could actually lead to really significant confusion and disagreement. And this could create uncertainty and confusion for both the primary care team that's looking after the patient and the patient and their family who now has even less idea potentially of what's actually going on. Because you have to imagine that even if you are seeking a second opinion, there is no guarantee that that second opinion is going to be correct, and it assumes that the first team have made a mistake where there may be none. What should happen, for example, if the first team, the specialist team, let's say I work in neurosurgery, right? Let's say that we, the neurosurgery team, made the correct call in managing the patient, but the family are worried, they ask for a second opinion, the intensive care team comes along, and the intensive care team makes a mistake, and they misdiagnose or misunderstand what's going on with the patient. Who carries the responsibility for that? Who then has ultimate care over the patient if there is a disagreement about who's correct? The ITU team or critical care or whoever's doing the review can't take over every patient where there's a mistake being made. They can't do that. They don't have the resources. Equally, the first team may have made the correct call and they may have the burden of responsibility taken away, despite the fact that they were safely managing the patient in the first place. You've got to remember that each step of the process is an opportunity for a mistake to be made, and we don't know at any given time who is ultimately going to be correct. Case outcomes can only be decided in retrospect at the end of an entire care process, which is too often after a patient has died. And even then, that is often a matter of opinion, as is come to by coroners, by medical examiners during an autopsy, forensic examination, all of these processes that take place at the very end, looking at all of the facts of a case. Ultimately, what I'm trying to get at is how do we decide who is right and wrong? So in essence, to sum everything up, Martha's Law is a potentially really transformative case for the UK and the NHS, ensuring that patients and their families have the legal right to a second opinion and reassurance from an independent team. It is absolutely not without drawbacks, however, and however it's introduced in the UK, it needs to be really carefully regulated and legislated to ensure that patients get the best care and we get the best outcomes for them. So thanks very much for watching, guys. Please be sure to hit that like button for me, leave a comment, subscribe. Don't forget to go and check out my website. Are there topics that you'd like to see for this round of med school interviews? Let me know in the comments. Take care and good luck.